Good evening, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our Wednesday night Bible study. This is our midweek time in which we engage in exegesis, where we're going to be able to explore the Word of God. And exegesis is just a fancy way of saying to draw out the meaning. And we also include eisegesis, to where we include our own perspective and our own views once we draw out the meaning of the text. And Wednesday night Bible study is a time when you need to have your Bibles ready. You make sure you grab your Bible and make sure you have a pen, a highlight or something, or have your laptop. You can bring a computer, laptop, something. We'll, we're going to go through the Word of God together. And I've been dealing with the theme of the Holy Spirit as our advocate and trying to show the different ways how God has been our advocate. We talked about Jesus, and now we've moved on to the Spirit of Christ, how the Holy Spirit works as our advocate. And then as we this unfolds, we will move to the third dimension of who else is our advocate. But right now we're on the Holy Spirit as our advocate. And tonight I'm excited to be able to talk with you about that. But before we get to the text, I always like to go through any announcements that we have. And this is exciting because we have this weekend our all-night prayer. All-night prayer. Perk up, get excited, get energized, have joy. We can have all-night prayer. Starting this Friday at 8 p.m., we have our all-night prayer. And that's going to run until Saturday at 8 p.m. 24 straight hours of intercessory prayer. This is the time when you should feel free. Come on the prayer line. And if you got some long-winded prayers, this is the time when you can unlock your long-winded prayers. You can, you can go ahead and pray. You can feel free to pray. Sometimes you're boxed into an hour in the morning or in the evening. We got 24 straight hours. So you're free to come on. You're free to stay on for 24 straight hours of intercessory prayer. You can even go to sleep on intercessory prayer. Just make sure your phone is on mute so we don't hear the snoring. But you can be on prayer as much as you want, as often as you want. This is the time. So be sure to join us for prayer. We're excited about this. And bring the concerns, any special prayer requests, any special concerns. You can bring them to all night prayer. So you can come on board for all night prayer. Also, we're going to do something special with, uh, I believe it was Minister Dale had this idea. This, this I wasn't the... I wasn't the originating point for this idea as far as what I'm about to say now. Minister Dale had an idea of at a certain point I'll have it to where we all pray at the same time for something. We all pray collectively for something. She brought that idea to me. I prayed about it. I thought about it. And I think it's an excellent idea. And so we, we all take a request and we pray together on the line all at one time. So I'm going to have a time when I incorporate that in terms of our prayer. But this 25-hour prayer is something that God laid on my heart a while ago to do all-night prayer. Way back when we had it first at the church. And this is something I want to continue with. And as I said before, we're going to do this every few months. So this one is October and I'll probably do another one in December. For all night prayer and um, I always have the deacons and some of the ministers lead but I'm also picking other people as guided by the Holy Spirit to be prepared to lead all night prayer and so that list was disseminated today I went through it yesterday on Tuesday and went through it and sent it to deacon and now it's gonna be disseminated as far as that on as who will lead prayer so be excited and join us for all night prayer. Invite someone. Invite someone. If you fight fighting with your spouse, get them on the prayer line. If you disagree, with someone, invite them to prayer. If you got a friend, neighbor, anybody, invite them. Come on prayer. They can come and pray for one minute, or they can stay for hours and pray. It's up to them. Or they can just drop in throughout the twenty-four hour time period. But we're excited about all night prayer and. We're going to commence it Friday at 8 p.m. I'm going to start it off at the 8 p.m. time. I always like to start it off. And then on the back end, 
that last hour I got Brother Robinson and Sister Hendrick doing that. Then I like to wrap it up at the end. So once it gets to about 7.55, I like to wrap it up the next day. So we have our all-night prayer. Also keep in mind our Haiti effort. This is going to be the last week. I'm going to mention it another Sunday that we collect for Haiti. So make sure that you contribute towards the Haiti effort. We're seeking to help improve the lives of young people in another country who are having great economic difficulty and educational difficulties and not able to have access to the same things that we have access to. So make sure you contribute towards the Haiti effort. Contribute towards the Haiti effort. Donate what you can towards Haiti and you can do that online easily. That can easily be done. And so we want to make sure we contribute to the Haiti effort. Also keep in mind, upcoming, we're going to have our church-wide prayer, not tonight, but next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, 6 p.m., church-wide prayer. I ask everyone come on for church-wide prayer. And on Thursday, tomorrow we have our pastoral care meeting. Everybody who's involved in pastoral care you're called to be a part of this meeting. So we'll have our pastoral care meeting tomorrow night, and we're going to do it right after the women's fitness class. It'll be at 8 p.m. And you'll get details pertaining and joining that meeting at 8 p.m. Thursday night. We have a wonderful pastoral care meeting. And so we want to remain connected and encouraged during this time. And I want to just say something to you to each and every person right now. During this time, Remain encouraged. The enemy will try to attack you. And the enemy will come after you and try to destroy you. You got to stay fortified and remain encouraged. If you lost your job, remain encouraged. If your relationship is struggling, remain encouraged. If you don't think anybody cares about you or likes you, remain encouraged. And tonight's Bible study is going to help you because I'm going to deal with that some as well in what we're talking about. But stay strong. Stay encouraged. Know that you are loved. And stay encouraged. Know that God loves you. I love you. Mount Zion loves you. The collective body, we all love you. And to remain encouraged. Get on, sometimes it's good to hear somebody's voice. That's why it's good to get on the prayer line, just to hear somebody else's voice. That's why it's good to connect with other believers. That's why we have the activities that we have so you can connect. Because isolation is one of the precursors to falling into depression. Isolation is a precursor to depression. If you want to obtain liberation and be brought out of depression, you need to have interactions. Interaction is the solution to depression. I'm not saying some people don't need medication, but it's the solution to depression. Interaction with God and then interaction with other people. It helps to bring wholeness and healing. And that brings emotional wholeness. It helps to heal the disjointedness within us sometimes being around people. That's why it's very dangerous to be isolated. That's why if somebody lives with someone and the person is going through failing in terms of mental failings, brain function failings, sometimes they feel isolated. It's a dangerous place to feel isolated because then you can be on the verge of a breakdown. you got to have somebody there support. And in the church, we need to support one another. That's why I'm going to charge us all with this task. Check on somebody. Check on somebody. Just see how they're doing. And don't call them and tell them about you. Oh, my big toe is hurting. Oh, my elbow is hurting. I'm so tired. I don't know I'm making it. No, don't call with a pity story. Call and check on somebody, and you can say, the Holy Spirit led me. The Holy Spirit led me to check on you. All you got to do is pray, and God will lead you to check on certain people. God will tell you, check on so-and-so. Pray for this person. So-and-so is not doing that. Well, the Holy Spirit will lead you. You know, I just called to check on you just to see how you were doing. You'll be surprised by the impact that can make on somebody's life. Because one of the things the church is called to be is a place we care about one another. In life, people don't really care about you. Your job, they'll use you. People, people will use you in relationships. They'll just use you. But the church is called to be a place we truly love one another. As the first century bishop said, and you know I love history, Tertullian, the first century bishop, 
he said the church was noted by see how they love one another in the expression of love. That's one of the earmarks of the church. And one week I'll go through that. I'm even take one week and go through the Baptist distinctives because I don't know if people know those three categories, but they are three distinctives known as the Baptist distinctives that I'm a teacher on. But the church is always known by its love. Now tonight, I'm going to ask you to open back up me to Hebrews. And remember where we left off? We were in Hebrews chapter 8 first. And I spoke about the new covenant. This week we can go a little further. So last week you got the three dimensions of the new covenant. And I was just about to cover it again, but I'm not going to do that. If you want to know the three benefits of the new covenant, go and look at last week's lesson. Go and look at that teaching. Go and look at that teaching. Tonight, we're going to keep picking up on when I was talking about, we're going to learn about the benefits of the new covenant. But I've been teaching about the Holy Spirit as our advocate and how he helps us in a number of ways. And he helps us to overcome generational curses. And if you open with me to Hebrews chapter 8, let's take a look at verses 8 through 12. Well, you know what? We're going to read 8 through 13. You really only need 10 through 12, but I love for us to know context. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 13. And we're going to take a look at that. It says, God finds fault with them when he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors. On the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. Amen. That's the basis for the new covenant. And tonight we're going to pick up in the third dimension I hit on last week where I discussed that the new covenant, the tertiary benefit, the third one, the third benefit that you get is the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. And tonight I'm going to deal with the fact of how the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit plays the role as our advocate of helping, to, helping us to reclaim our self-worth. He helps us to reclaim our self-worth. If I'm going to talk for a minute, the biggest problem in the body of Christ is that a lot of time people come to church broken and they never get healed or made whole. They just stay broken. And the brokenness normally affects their self-image, self-esteem. Well, normally, whatever somebody goes through has, seems to affect their self-image and self-esteem. For example, somebody can go through a divorce and they'll walk around and carry themselves sometimes like, I failed, my marriage didn't work out. And they'll associate the failure of the marriage and claim it for themselves as a failure as a person. And they'll just classify, I'm a divorcee, I'm a divorcee. I'm, and they'll classify, the, they'll associate themselves with that. They'll, some people will feel bad about themselves because of what they went through in the marriage. Addiction sometimes. Sometimes somebody had an addiction and they overcame the addiction, but they'll still say, I'm an addict. Well, see, I'm an addict. Uh, and they'll walk around. The addiction could have been 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 
and they will still walk around with the thoughts of not being worthy, not being good enough. So you can just probably look at them. They can give them a look and they think they're judging me on the basis of who I used to be. Oh, they think I'm an addict. They think this about me. This is what they think about me. And they'll walk around with poor self-esteem. That's one of the great challenges in the collective church body. Sometimes I'll give someone an assignment and the first thought a lot of times with people is they question, they question their own self-worth, their own self-esteem. They always have a reason why they can't do it. I don't have the education. I didn't go to grad school. I didn't go to undergrad. I didn't get a degree. I'm not educated enough. I don't write well enough to do this. I don't write well enough. I, don't, I, I can't get them speaking in front of people. They don't want to hear what I have to say. People don't want to listen to me. They don't want to hear. They want to hear it from so and so, but not from me. I'm not good enough at it. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve to be able to do that. It's a question of worth. Sometimes people will sit in meetings and and they don't know I can tell, but I can tell. They sit and hoping I don't call on them, so that they don't have to talk. They won't have to read. They won't have to do anything, because what comes over them is a feeling of I'm not good enough. And honestly, that message is communicated by the world. People will make you not feel good enough. You got a poor supervisor. You got a poor boss on the job. They will make you feel like you're a terrible employee. They'll make you feel like it. They'll make you feel like it. They'll try to get rid of you. They'll try to get somebody else. They'll make you feel like what you do is never good enough and doesn't measure up to what it's supposed to be. That's why it's terrible if you have a bad boss, because then you'll feel I'm never worthy. And sometimes people can make you feel unworthy. And the truth is a lot of times in the home is where the esteem is destroyed first. Growing up, the esteem is destroyed. Sometimes parents destroy your esteem in the home. They don't see certain things in you. And they don't say enough positive things. They, they don't tell you enough good about yourself. Sometimes the bad you do is picked out, but the good you do is never discussed. And what happens is you'll learn to feel unworthy. You'll learn to feel, I don't deserve to be celebrated. I don't deserve to be in the forefront. I don't deserve to be a leader. I don't deserve to be in the position of, I don't deserve this in life. I don't deserve that. And how that plays out in people's lives is they don't have to say it. They just live life at a lower level than God intended for them because of poor self-worth. Think about this. The first thing Adam did when he sinned was he, he hid himself. He hid who he was. We look at he physically hid himself. No, he hid the whole essence of his being, of who he was. He took the part of him that communicated and would talk with God and pulled it back and pulled it away because he felt unworthy. Unworthy. Yes, he tried to cover himself physically. But what he was really trying to do was hide the essence of who he was from God because he felt less than. And it's a terrible thing to wrestle with a poor self-image because when somebody has a poor self-image, they live under self-condemnation. You don't have to say anything to them. They say it to themselves. And you can always tell when somebody wrestles with low self-esteem or poor self-image, because the first thing you do when things get tough, whenever it's time for engagement, it's time for, it may be time to go through conflict, deal with something, they run. Because the thought is, I'll quit. I'll give up, because I don't deserve this. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve it, so they run away. And they hide. They do what Adam did. People don't even realize in life sometimes they have patterns of hiding, of hiding again and again due to a poor self-image. And the home shapes the self-image. So the home that's grown up in, the parenting that's rendered, shapes the self-image. It, it shapes the image where we view ourselves, what we think we're capable of, what we think we can do. It places a lid on our lives or it takes the lid off of our lives. 
to see what we're capable of. And I would say this, when we have a healthy self-esteem, a healthy self-worth, it doesn't matter who's there, you feel worthy. You feel good enough. It doesn't matter if it's the president, it doesn't matter if it's the greatest dignitary, you feel I'm worthy. When you feel unworthy, it doesn't matter if it's a person at the lowest level of societal structures, you still don't feel I'm good enough. And tonight what I wanna do is help us feel I'm worthy. This, this is going to help somebody tonight to know you're worthy. Sometimes you got to start telling yourself, I am worthy. I deserve it. I deserve it. That helps people not be envious of other people. You want the secret why people are jealous of other people? People are jealous of other people because they don't think anything themselves. They don't think anybody else. They don't think anything anybody else. So they don't think I deserve it. So why you deserve it? If I don't think I deserve something, I don't think you deserve. If I don't think you deserve to go to college. Why well, I think I should? If I don't think I deserve to be able to be in certain positions, why would I think of somebody else? So the first thing we have to do is build a healthy self-image. And one of the generational curses that's passed on in the homes, in the homes of minorities a lot of times that we have is the destruction of self-image. That's why I don't like it if I see a parent tear down a child or see somebody turn down the child and put placing limits on them. That's that's why there's no cursing at a child. You don't curse at a child. That's why you don't tell a child they're stupid. That's why you don't tell a child they can't do certain things. Now I'm not talking about breaking rules and discipline. I'm talking about placing limits on them. Well, oh, that's stupid. Or you this, you that. You just like this. Sometimes you hear them tell them they just like a parent who they're no longer with, who's recalcitrant, a parent who's backwards and then you just like your mother or you just like your father, you're tearing the child down and that tears a person down. And our goal as believers is to help build up the esteem of other people, but first we gotta build up our own. And so one of the great generational curses that's wrestled with is a poor self image. That's a generational curse, having a poor self image. That's a generational curse. And the good news thing, I'm going to help us. The Holy Spirit has come to help us regain the power over our lives. The Holy Spirit has come to help us regain control over our lives. The Holy Spirit has come so that we are able to obtain that Christ-like identity that God has for us. And Christ dying for us, one of the great statements he's making is, you're worthy. Christ dying for me says, I'm worthy enough to die for. Christ dying for me says, I'm worthy enough to go to heaven. Christ dying is saying, I'm so worthy that I don't deserve to go to hell, but I deserve to go to heaven. His death, his death means you're worthy. So sometimes we got to do is tune out people who try to tell us we're not worthy and deal with God is saying we are worthy. And in that dimension of the new covenant we're going to hit on, it's that third one that deals with the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of our sins. My sins have been pardoned. My sins have been forgiven. That's good news today. It's good news to know that your sins have been forgiven. It's good news to know that your sins have been pardoned. It's good news to know that whatever you've done in the past, you don't have to live in that judgment anymore. That's good news. You're able to know our sins have been forgiven. In verse number 12, I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Since my sins have been forgiven, since my sins have been forgiven, I don't have to be held hostage to my past mistakes and past failures. I don't, I don't have to live in the past. I don't have to live in what was. I don't have to live in what I used to do. I don't have to live in my past mistakes holding me hostage and destroying my esteem. Our sins have been forgiven by God, which means he doesn't hold me accountable for them anymore, which means then I'm worthy to live and be a new being. You, you, you're worthy. You don't got to live hostage anymore. I don't live hostage anymore to, oh, I deserted, I abandoned, oh, I gave up, oh, I quit. I don't have to live hostage to my past sins. So what I was does not define 
who I am. I'm going to help you today. You want to overcome some things. I don't care who is in your life. I don't care who it is. I don't care if they're in your family. I don't care if they're a friend, who it is. If they always bring up to you your past sins, you have to find a way to move those people out of your life. They either got to change. Sometimes you got to have hard conversations. You got to sit down and say, stop bringing that up to me. You got to give them a chance first. You got to say, stop bringing up what I used to do. Stop bringing up my indiscretions from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. This, this is going to help people. Sometimes people, esteem is ruined by the past sin. People bring up, you had an abortion 20 years ago. Sometimes you got to let it go. Hey, people hold you hostage to it. Oh, you you didn't take care of your responsibilities. You abandoned the child. Well, if you came back and you're trying, you're making an effort. People hold you hostage. Oh, I remember when you were out in the world and sinning. Okay, don't keep bringing it up to me. I'm not doing that now. And so what has to happen today is you got to remove those sources that are channels that come into you that pour negativity, that pour destruction of esteem, that pour into you the things that tear you down and make you feel less than. If God says he was not going to remember my sins anymore, I'm not going to let people remember my sins anymore. They're not greater than God. Nobody's greater than God. So if he say he ain't going to do it, you can't let people do that to you either. Sometimes I look at people and think they're crazy because sometimes they'll go to, I'm going to my family reunion. Well, isn't that the one you tell me they tear you down? That Yep, but I got to go. They're my family. No, no, no. You're not my family if you tear me down. I'm not going to willingly show up somewhere to be destroyed. To, to me, sometimes people do the craziest things in the world. They will show up because some, well, that's my cousin. Okay, but your cousin's destroying you. Oh, that's my brother. Okay, but he's destroying you. That doesn't mean anything. I, I got to follow what Jesus said. They came to get Jesus. Go back and read the Gospels. His mother and brothers came to get him. And he was, he was preaching, teaching, healing. And they said, oh, he's gone mad. Let's take him home. Jesus said, they said, your mother and brothers. He said, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? He said, those who do the will of my father. Those who do the will of God. And so what you got to do is have a circle it doesn't torment you with your past sins. You got they can't torment with your past sins. You have to have a circle that presents to you the present possibilities that exist in your life. You need a circle that presents the present possibilities that exist for your life. People who see who you can be. That's the best relationship to be in. You know the best husbands and wives? It's when they both see who the other can be. They don't beat them up for what they did years ago but they enjoy them in the now and see who they can be. It's nothing as beautiful as when somebody tells you they see the growth in you. They see the development in you. That they see who you can be. That, that, that gets you excited. When somebody sees who you can be, I see you can be in this position. I see this for your life. I see you rising to this level. I see what's possible for you. And that's why it's so, so important that you surround yourself with people at a mindset of Christ. I preached about this on Sunday, and it's picking up this Sunday. But I preached about the how when you deal with the spiritual gifts, you're dealing with the divine intellect, the divine mindset. That's the Christ-like mindset, the God mindset. And the mind of Christ is a mind that empowers. It's a mind that exhorts. It's a, mind, it's a mind that enables. That's the mind of Christ. It encourages. That's the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ sees who someone can be. When you get deep in the spiritual realm, you see who someone can be. You see who they can be. You don't deal with who you're looking at now. You, you look deeper. You don't look with these eyes. You look with the eyes of God and you see this is who they can be. Yeah, they're here right now. But one day they're going to be here. Yeah, this may be keeping them down, but one day they're going to be free and be up here. And so it's so critical when you embrace the power of the Holy Spirit and you see him as your advocate. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. He frees me from the condemnation of my past sins. Sometimes your own mind holds you hostage. Your own mind will bring back to you the things that were done to you. 
Your mind will tell you, no, I was physically abused. Your mind will bring back to you, oh, it's my fault I went through the molestation. It's my fault I endured the rape. It's my fault that the assault took place. I must have did something wrong that I was abused. I must have done something wrong. That's demonic. That's Satan attacking you. What God would have you do is let you know that no matter what has happened to you in your life, I still love you and I'm for you. That's what God will always let you know. I still love you. I'm for you. And I got a great and bright future for you. I got a great future for you. I got a great vision for your life. If you stay with me in Hebrews, flip with me to just to go to chapter 9. All you got to do is move one chapter over. And then verse number 11. And we're going to stop. I'm going to pick up. We're going to stop at 14 for now. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. Verse 14, you can highlight how much more will the blood of Christ who, the, who through the eternal spirit. Look at the duality you see in those verses. Of I'm cleansed. And tonight we're going to deal some with that dimension of sanctification. You can get that down of sanctification. You sanctified by the blood of Christ, but the blood of Christ sanctifies you, but you also sanctified through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, it's the same thing. Hagios pneuma, the Holy Spirit, the eternal spirit. The Holy Spirit is known as the eternal spirit because he's always existed. Oh, always. That's the eternality of God, of who he is, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so we sanctify it. And sometimes we deal with the set-apart dimension of sanctification. But tonight we're going to deal with the other dimension of sanctification, being cleansed. And cleansed. And what God does is purge us of all our unrighteousness, of all our sin. Of it. He purges us of it. Anything that's unclean in us. He, cl he cleans it up. He cleanses us. It's just like the best example I can think of, and I try to think of something else, but the best example, a laxative. Sometimes if you backed up, you say, I've eaten vegetables, I've done everything to try to use the restroom, but I need something to cleanse my system. You take a laxative and it cleanses you out. Today you have, I see it all the time. Typically I see women do this, but they have the, uh, uh, the cleansing diets. But they'll say, what I'm going to do is cleanse my system. So for three days, all I'm going to do is drink this green juice, and my body's going to be cleansed. Then some people say, 21 days. I got 21-day juice cleanse. Once I drink this juice, it's going to cleanse me out. My whole body will be cleansed, and it'll filter out the impurities and other things. And it's, it's a cleansing. And what happens with God is he cleanses us out. All the junk the world put in us. Okay, this is the home. It puts something in us. Okay, this is what came from the job. It puts something in us. Okay, this is what came from friends and relationships. This puts something in us. Okay, this is what came from those who came across your path. It puts something in us. This is what came from the enemies. It puts something in us. This is what we got off social media. It puts something in us. He takes all that junk. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And he cleanses it all out. He, he cleans us out to where he makes his abode with him. And then he purges us from what held us hostage. So today, guilt. Guilt can't hold me hostage anymore. Shame can't hold me hostage anymore. You want to be cleansed of shame? That's a generational curse. Some families, they, they carry shame. They walk around ashamed. All you got to do is deal with God and embrace the fact that you're worthy in God. Embrace the worth that God has given to you, precious in his sight. You are his child. You're a child of the king. When you embrace that, what happens is you start to realize, what was I afraid of? 
who was I ashamed of? What was, who, who, who can judge me? Who can judge, the people can't judge you. And what makes life horrible is if you live in the opinions of people. That's why one thing I pride myself on, you're going to never hear me ask what they saying about me. What they think of this, what they think of that. You will go insane worried about what people think. You always got to go to one person. What you think? What does God think? That's the one thing. I'm not saying what do you think humanly. What does the you as God, what does he think? And if God says, well done, you all right. If God says, you good in my book, you all right. If God tells you, God will tell you. God will tell you when you do wrong. You know where our people judgment, God will tell you and then say, go and make this right. Go repent and make it right. So, and you cleansed again. God will keep cleansing you. That's the good thing about God. Is sometimes in life, we get dirtied up again. We'll have a rough day and then say, okay, now I'm going to lay so-and-so out. Now I'm going to tell so-and-so up. Now I'm going to get on so-and-so. And what God got to do is say, come back in here. I got to cleanse you all over again. Get back in this bubble bath and let me cleanse you all over again. Because the Holy Spirit cleanses us till we become new creatures. And he cleanses us from the power of sin. Tonight I want you to hear me. The power of sin has no hold over you. The power of your past has no hold over you. Whatever I've done previously does not have a hold over me. You got to tell yourself that. That's why when you're able to do something, you can do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is restricted when we live in the sins that we used to commit. It holds back the power because then doubt comes in. It's not the Spirit can't do it. It's that we don't have the faith for it to get done. And the key to channeling the power of the Holy Spirit is faith. I got to believe. You got somebody sick in the hospital and you're going to pray for them. The first thing you got to do, believe. Before you go in the room, before you even talk to them, the first thing you got to do, talk to God. And before you pray for me, you got to believe. I had to learn, it took me a long time to learn that you can't even pray till you believe. You, you, you can't even really do it till you believe. You got to have faith. So I can't be praying, God, heal so-and-so when I got tremendous doubt in my mind. The first thing I had to do is conquer the doubt. Then when I conquer the doubt, I can tap into the power of God. And sometimes you got to tell God, you don't got to do it yourself. Lord, help my unbelief. God, I don't even believe it can be done. Help me have faith. That's the amazing thing. Before you ask God for something else, sometimes you got to ask God, give me the faith to believe that you can do what I'm about to ask you for. The New Testament says it best. It says it best. He had belief, but he said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. And the King James Version, help thou my unbelief. And that's something we wrestle with. It's hard, it's going to be very hard to have confidence in myself if I don't have confidence in God. And so first, when we address the issue of I can trust him, I got faith in him, then I can have faith and confidence in me. And so one of the great works of the Holy Spirit is to deal with the sins that we commit. Flip with me to 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to see the connection again in 1 John chapter 1. And before I read 1 John 1, I meant to hit upon something in Hebrews. You know I love the background of a text. Hebrews deals with Christ as our high priest. That's something I meant to say off the bat. But you get the dimension of Christ as our high priest. He's constantly offering and presenting before God offerings. I should say presenting before God offerings. Or you can say he's offering sacrifices. He's constantly giving to God. And that's what he did on the cross. But Hebrews deals with he's our high priest. And one of the great things he's done, he mediated a new covenant, a better covenant. And I talked about covenant last week. He mediated a new covenant. And that covenant has given us the benefit of the forgiveness of our sins. A covenant makes you worthy in the eyes of God. The forgiveness of our sins makes us worthy in the eyes of God. The new covenant makes me worthy in the eyes of God. That's why we don't have to go out and keep sacrificing bulls. Don't have to give rams. We have to keep killing animals. Because the new covenant, which was ushered in by Christ, has brought about to where we obtained righteousness. The righteousness of God. Righteousness is right standing, but in order to have the right standing, somebody has to declare me worthy. And since Christ died for my sins, he declared me worthy. Now I can have the right standing before God, and I can stand before God. That's how you can pray. 
you have right standing before God because our sins have been forgiven. And so we've been declared worthy by God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's one of my favorite scriptures. And you want to cleanse yourself from generational curses? One of the secrets is to do the opposite of what your family normally tells you to do. When you want to be cured from a generational curse, you got to be willing to confess the sins. Satan gets his power from keeping things in the darkness. That's where his power comes from. Things hidden in darkness. He is hidden in dark. He loves when things are hidden in darkness. Because then the sin can develop. It can grow. Sin doesn't grow in the light. Sin grows in darkness. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of God's state. But God brings things to the light fit to grow. Satan takes things in the dark so that they can grow. When they're exposed to the light, they die. And so in families, what's always hidden are the generational curses. A negative family, a gossiping family, never talks about that they gossip. They never mention it. They never discuss it. They never sit down and have an open conversation. It just, so it keeps its power over the family because nobody breaks the curse. A family in which everybody's jealous of each other. They never discuss their jealousy of each other. They just lie to each other. Oh, I just love you. No, they're jealous of each other. And so jealousy keeps its power over the family. A family with sexual sins. No one ever discusses that uncle so-and-so is a molester. No one ever discusses that so-and-so got raped. No one ever discusses it. And so it keeps its power, sexual sins, over the family. Addiction is covered. Everything is covered up. And so the power remains over the family. The curse then just goes from one to another. And the children aren't even aware of the generational curse. It just comes after them. That same demon and spirit comes after them and takes control over them. If you want to destroy the power of a generational curse, I gave some of the secrets to rebuking demons in my sermon a few weeks ago when I talked about praying over an area and touching it and anointing it but one of the other things to do and go back and look at that sermon to get the whole thing to make i want to make sure you watch that sermon but one of the other things we do is that we confess the sins sometimes you got to confess the sins of those who came before you got to expose it you got to bring it to light confess it sometimes confession is you confess before god but then you got to sit down and discuss it in the family we can break the power of this curse our family, we're a good family, but we got this issue in the family. We're going to destroy this curse. And I'm going to point to you now because it's your job to destroy the generational curses in your family. It's your job to destroy the generational curses in your family. Don't leave curses behind for your children, your grandchildren, your nephews, your nieces. Don't leave curses behind for others to have to battle because you didn't slay the demon. You can destroy the curse right now. You can destroy it. Confess it. Confess it before God. You call on the power of the Holy Spirit and you pull together and battle against the demon that's attacking the family. You got to build up a wall. And every time you pray, you got to see it as I'm putting another brick on that wall. Every time you call that demon out, and you go ahead and you claim the power of Jesus Christ. You're putting a brick on that wall. You expose it to the light. And then you build up and fortify defense against the enemy. That's what you got to see coming to church. If you don't come to church to please me, you don't come to church to please Deacon Monroe, you don't come to church to please nobody. You come to church to please God. And you come to church because you're building up a defense. You don't come to church to please human beings. You come to church for him. 
and then you're building up your defense. You get more arrows in your repertoire. So then you're learning, okay, I can fight demons this way. Okay, I learned a new scripture that I can battle the enemy with. Okay, I learned a new strategy that I'm able to attack in spiritual warfare. Okay, I learned I got to call out the generational curse. And that then I got to claim the dominion of God over the generational curse. And then I may have to pray over the area where that generational curse is occupied and pray over the people who that generational curse is, is flowing through. And then I may have to pull together a prayer team united together and we all work together to destroy this generational curse. You learn the strategies so that you're able to manifest the power of God. And then when you pray, you should pray with authority. Authority. When you got power with God, sometimes you don't got to do a whole lot. Sometimes all you got to do is call on him. That's what he taught Elijah. He had let, let, let Elijah know, I'm not, in, I'm not in the rain, I'm not in the thunder, I'm not in the earthquake, I'm not in the stuff you think I'm in. I'm in the still, small voice. And it, sometimes that'll shock people. Because you, know, you hear somebody pray, and you say they're yelling, and they're praying over a storm, and that prayer then fell right on the ground. And then somebody else, they fumbling for words, they don't know what to say, it's not as loud, and they just doing the best they can, and that prayer is moving a mountain because God senses the relationship, the sincerity of heart, and his power is going to flow through them. That's one of the dimensions I'm going to hit to in upcoming weeks. I always tell people, if you want to be in ministry, if you want to do anything great for God, you need confidence, yes, but you better have humility. That's the juxtaposition you got to have. You got to have confidence if you don't have nothing, people will destroy you. But you better be humble. Humility, humility, humility. Arrogance, God can't get the glory because you claim it all for yourself. Humility allows God to get the glory through you and through your life. And humility means he can just flow through you. Because his thing is, I can use you as my vessel. And so we're going to regain the power over our lives. So tonight, I'm going to help us. I never want to hear us say, well, that's just how I am. I can't change this. That just runs in my family. That's a lie. That is a lie. Because in God, I have power over any deficiency, over any sin, over any evil, evil habits, evil words, evil thoughts. Anything that's wrong and not in congruity with the will of God is meant to be expunged. Now, the good things that we get in our families. The good things we get from those around us, those are the patterns we made to keep. We made to maintain. That's why you pull from your family. You pull the spirituality. If you got a spiritual family, you pull that. If you got a family where they got a good work ethos, you pull the work ethic. If you got a family where you say they generous to help you, you pull that. If you got a family that's stingy, you push that to the side and you go pull something else. You got a family with no spiritual background, you push that to the side and you pull something else. You have to pull from a different area. Sometimes you got to do a drink from different areas. And so you got to find what's the area that God has for me to go to. And so I just want us to know tonight, I'm going to leave us with that thought, but I just want us to know, you got power over your life through the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit allows me to reclaim my life to have victory in every dimension area of my life some families it's a poverty mindset and what you got to do is break the cycle and next week we're going to deal more with the confession dimension but in confessing sometimes you got to speak some things into existence i always notice this people are afraid to speak great things into existence they always reject it one day you're going to be this no not me one day you'll have this, no, not me. One day you'll be in a position to do that, no, not me. And they don't realize what you've just done is send something out into the universe to where your words continue to move throughout the air and it's gonna come to, it's gonna come back in your life. I don't believe there's any power in the universe, but I believe there's power in the tongue and whatever you speak, you speaking it into existence. And so in our own lives, next week we're gonna deal with how you speak some things into existence. You got to speak into existence, my family will be better. You got to speak into existence, 
I am worthy. My life is going to be better. I'm significant. I have great value. I matter. You got to speak some things into existence. And so it can come into being. But that deals with having a dream and then making that dream into reality. Notice this. Even with Martin Luther King, how you know he had a dream? Because he told you. A dream wouldn't do him any good if he just had a dream and it stayed in the recesses of his mind. He spoke that dream into existence. He spoke his dream into existence. People have dreams, but they don't speak them into existence. You got to speak your dream that God gives you into existence. And next week, I'm going to talk more about that in terms of the Holy Spirit as our help. How you, the power of the tongue, the power of confession, and how you can speak these things into existence, the spoken word, when you deal with the word. And we might as well look at the dimensions of the word. We know Jesus is the Logos. That's one form of word. But then in the Greek, there are other types of word. He's known as the Logos, the word, the word of God. And I'm going to close with this. And it's the beginning of next week. Notice that everything created was made by the spoken word. He spoke it into existence. And we'll look at that next week, how he spoke it into existence. How you can speak things into existence. You have that authority, that power. But first, my self-worth got to be aligned. Because if I don't think I'm worthy, I can't, I'm can't. i not going to be speaking things into existence because I don't think my words have any power. You got to know your words have power. That's why you don't curse people. That's why you don't destroy people because you know your words have power. Your words have power because of your covenant relationship with God. And so we're going to start breaking generational curses. Generational curses can be broken. When you see a multitude of young people born out of wedlock, when you got the rate is 78, 80% in homes where there's no marriage, that's a generational curse. All that has to do is be broken. When you have curses where nobody goes on and finishes high school, that's a generational curse. Curses of poverty, generational curse, they need to be broken. And our job as intercessors is to break generational curses. I'm going to leave it here for tonight, but we'll pick up next week and deal further along with that. Lord, we pray right now that each person that hears this message has a healthy self-image and self-esteem and that you build it up from the inside. We rebuke the power of any sins that have taken place in life that have robbed from the sense of self and the image that you've given. You made us in your image and your likeness and you named us after yourselves. You've called us your people and you promised to be our God. This day, Lord, I ask, Father God, that you help us to embrace the image and the likeness you've made us into and help us, Father God, to see our own worth and value. Even when society doesn't ascribe it to us, we know you have and that, Father God, we're valuable in your eyes and that you are God who's able to open doors that even the world cannot block. And so we ask, Father God, help us to see the fullness of who you created us to be and to walk in the greatness that you place within each of us. Now for these to rise to the heights you called us to be at and to take great positions in society. Help us to great, great, great positions that you called us to be at. Help us to rise to places that nobody can stop us. Now for us to represent you and to reflect your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I want us to remember this. It's important to note your worth and the value you have to God, even when society tell you that you don't have it. I always say this as a black man, society will make you feel as if you don't have value, but you gotta know you're not your race by accident. You're not your race by accident, you got value. I don't care what indirect message society tries to give, you have value. And so you do have to know your life matters. I, I know as a black, black lives matter. As a black man, it matters. I don't care what happens in society. I know it matters, which means we're going to keep fighting for justice. We keep looking for 
the justice of God. Like I'm saying, even in the murders of Breonna Taylor, we have to know her life mattered. I don't care who she was dating, who she was seeing. That does not mean that life should be cut short. I don't care if somebody, sometimes on the street, is in, they'll say, well, they were doing this, or they seem this way. If it's one thing somebody has a gun and is doing something. It's another thing where the life has value. The life has value. doesn't matter. doesn't matter the past of a person. The life still has value and dignity ascribed to it. And that's why it's so important to know your worth. Sometimes what happens is somebody's murdered or cut down, and we look at, well, what do they do to deserve it? You start from the wrong point. You got to say the life has value to God, and it's unjust. It's unjust. It's, it, that it's unjust. And so what we want to do is make sure we communicate your life has value. I don't care what message the world sends. I've gone to colleges with messages were sent. Well, the, you people don't matter as much. You still got to go achieve, become, because you got to know you matter to God. Overcome, no matter what the situation is, and the slaves knew that we overcome. That's why they sang, we shall overcome, overcome. Because God is always on the side of justice, and he has ascribed dignity and value to each and every one of us. I'm going to give us the benediction, and we can... Look to the Lord, and now unto him who is fully able to keep us from falling and present us faultless for his glorious presence with exceeding joy to the only wise, immutable, true God our Savior, be glory and majesty, both dominion and power, now and forever. Amen. Have a blessed Wednesday night. Have a blessed Wednesday night. Be blessed.